we start with uh, my dear friend, well, my kind of friend, Mike Broomhead, uh, who handles uh, 8 to noon here on KTAR News. Yeah, this is the, my time and a half right now. I think so. Okay. Yeah, right. Not double time, time and a half. Time right? and a half. You get, buddy. Okay. Um, here's how historic this, this election is. Uh, because right after the Super Tuesday primaries, when it became more than obvious that Donald Trump and Joe Biden would be their party's presidential nominees. Jamie West and I had ASU presidential historian Brooke Simpson on Arizona's Morning News to put it all into historical perspective. So have we ever in U.S. history had a former president running against a current president? Uh, yes, we have, but you have to go back to 1892. The year these two guys uh, when, were born. Uh, Grover Cleveland, <laughs> right. a Democrat who had been president between 1885 and 1889, took on the man he lost to in 1888, Benjamin Harrison. So you have to go back to 1892, Mike Broomhead, to find a former president running against a current president when immediate past president Grover Cleveland beat sitting president Benjamin Harrison, who had beaten Cleveland in, 19, in the 1888 presidential election. And as you pointed out, uh, probably the year that both of these two guys, yeah. Trump and Biden, were born. Yeah. Um, and if I wanted to be sarcastic, I would have asked, how did they vote in that election? <laughs> right. <laughs> they weren't that old. Yeah. They weren't 18 quite yeah. yet. Uh, so this is historical. Um, but I think a lot of people are saying, you know, uh, as Chuck Coughlin put it this morning for us, uh, the horse is already in the barn. Yeah, the issue for me is what I like about this is it is no longer about one person trying to say promises made, promises kept, and the other person making promises of how things are going to be better. We have two resumes to look at. Yeah. And the American people are going to look at four years of each person in the, you know, pretty close to the same time frame and decide which one is most capable. The interesting st statistic is 30% of those polled say neither. Yeah. No, I, I think there's so many people that uh, are just like, really, these two again? I think yeah. that's been a, a lot of the prevailing thought. So then what then, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but at the end of this election cycle, one of them will be gone from the from the public eye forever, as far as pol politics goes. Probably. And four years later, the other one will be done because they will have completed their second term. So uh, this is going to change the political landscape. Once this election is over, we are literally turning a page and looking at what the new leadership is going to look like. Wow. It it's really is... A place we've really almost never been here before. Right. But how many times did we say unprecedented during the Trump time sure. in office? Yeah, it, 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 but this also, we have no choice. It is going to turn the page. You look at Mitch McConnell leaving leadership, the passing of Dianne Feinstein. Other people are retiring in the Congress. We are going to see people aging out, whether they like it or not. And we are going to have a different goal, a different cast in the presidency. Uh, 2016, Donald Trump was a candidate. He's still a candidate now. This is a long time for to have the same few people in the running. So here's what to watch for, because we know it's going to be Biden and Trump, barring something crazy happening between now and the conventions or between the conventions and the general election. Trump and Biden will be competing in the November general election against each other. So what do we watch for today in Arizona's presidential preference election. So I mentioned this guy a little bit earlier, Chuck Coughlin. He runs High Ground Incorporated. He is a longtime political consultant. He was Governor Jan Brewer's political guy, uh, moved in, in Republican political circles for a long time. Uh, here he is breaking down what to look for today. The horse is in the barn here, right? We know who the nominees are going to be. And so this is really sort of a speculative venture today to see the enthusiasm that both parties' candidates generate within their base voters. So what's the turnout? How many actually turn out? All right. So in 2020, there was about a 48 percent turnout for that year in the primaries that Biden in that year that Biden won Arizona. Going back four years further than that, when Trump won in 2016, when we had all those Republicans on the ballot out here. Um, you had about a 56% electoral turnout. So we look at voter enthusiasm to help us kind of understand who might win Arizona in November. So if, if you get a larger percentage of Democrats turning out or a larger percentage of Republicans turning out, uh, do you see that as a way to kind of help determine who's going to be out in more numbers come November? No, I just think, I don't think so because we have had such a huge 
increase in independent voters who are not eligible to vote today, right. that that is going to be, turnout then is going to be the determining factor. How many independents are going to be motivated to show up at the polls? And we don't know the answer to that because today they're excluded. So we won't, I, we don't have an indicator there. I, you know, what's interesting is um, Chuck kind of broke this down for us right before Super Tuesday. And uh, it kind of goes to something I mentioned this morning and we actually talked about with uh, Chuck Coughlin uh, about, which is if you know Biden's going to win the Democratic nomination and it's already in, it's already it's in. It's done. Yeah. I mean, he has enough delegates as of last week and Trump has enough gel- delegates as of last week to secure the Republican nomination. So how many people are going to decide to make a protest vote? Uh, that's something we asked Chuck Coughlin this morning. There are other names on the ballot. Are we going to see much of a protest vote from either Republicans or Democrats? And is it important for those who would like to send the parties a message? Yeah, I think it is, Jamie. I think I think we will see some of that today. There's no doubt about it. Because nobody's happy with this outcome, right? Nobody's happy and delighted that we have these two older gentlemen as our final choice for president. Nice so we will definitely it. see some protest votes going on here. And then we'll see the impacts of that on the overall electorate when, when we come to November. Yeah, but in the long run, though, it, hang on a second. Here's, here's my question uh, that came after that is, does that really change anything? Because right. it, it's still going to be Biden. It's still going to be Trump. And whoever wins... If it's Biden or Trump, they're just going to completely forget that anybody voted against them. And and I think, but I here's where I would disagree with, and Chuck obviously has been doing this a lot longer than I've been doing it, and he's just so more invested. But as a voter, I look at this and I say, I would be more likely to walk away than I would be to cast a protest vote on, in an election that doesn't matter. And that this doesn't matter. I mean, I don't mean that. I, I don't. I don't mean that in a bad way. It's decided already. I right, should say right, it does right. matter, but it's decided. Yeah. That I think you're going to see more people. The protest vote will people will vote with their feet, and they won't show up in November. That the, that will be the protest votes. Will be the people that may show up at the polls to vote in the other races, but they will leave it blank. Or the most common thing to write in is Mickey Mouse, and they'll do that <laughs> in November. I don't think today will be the day that they protest. Interesting. Uh, so it's not going to be what we saw for pro-Palestinian voters in Michigan who did not committed rather than vote for Biden? Yeah, because I think they realize that it does and those were very impassioned people because they were, and I don't know that there's that same type of passion here for that issue and I just think that people will vote with their feet and say, I'll show my protest is going to be a protest of silence. Mm, yeah. That's what I think. Uh, I'm going to be interested to hear what you've been hearing because you're you're pretty involved in Republican politics. You go to committee hearings, uh, committee. You meet with committeemen, and you speak to groups uh, around the valley. And uh, I'm going to be really interested to hear what you have heard when it comes to <laughs> you know, is it is it Trump again, <laughs> or is there nothing but enthusiasm um. among? <laughs> among the Republican Party for uh, Trump. And we'll get to that in just a second. Mike Broomhead's with me a little later on in this hour. We will be talking with Maricopa County recorder Stephen Richer. You can still drop it off at any of the voting locations. You can still show up in person and vote. That's him talking about the PPE, the presidential preference election, which is going on today. And we are hosting a special on here on KTAR. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Coming up in the next little while here on our PPE special, Stephen Richer, Maricopa County recorder, will be joining us. Also, Garrett Archer, data analyst at ABC 15. The electorate in Maricopa County and elsewhere, of course, has basically become nationalized. And Democratic political consultant Stacey Pearson, who says of Joe Biden. He certainly could do Congressman Gallego a favor by performing well considering they're aligned on, on many, many policies. Right now, we are talking with uh, Mike Broomhead of the aptly named Mike Broomhead Show. You hear him from... What a coincidence. Eight to, I know. By the way, they went with my suggestion when uh, they said, we're gonna, trying to name this show. I'm like, go with the Mike Broomhead <laughs> Show. I'm telling you, it'll work real well. Um, let's talk a little bit about, as we, we look at the PPE um, today, we talked a little bit about the protest vote 
uh, just yeah. a few minutes ago. Uh, what are you hearing among Republicans? Because you move in Republican circles, you go to committee hearings, and uh, what do you what do yeah. you call them? Precinct committee hearings, yeah, that kind of the, stuff. And, yeah, the meetings. Yeah. And, and I'm not a precinct committee man. I right. gave that up years and years and years ago. Right. Uh, but I do get asked to speak to Republican groups and clubs and things like that fairly often. And um, any Trump dissenters. Um, there are there in those meetings. If they are, they're silent. Okay. But I will tell you what I still hear very often, election integrity. That is that is ah. still what they talk about in those meetings. I think it's a mistake. Um, I get into the debate because I like to have that conversation with people, and I try to be civil about it. But it doesn't matter what the topic we talk about is at the end for the question and answer session. It's still the question in those meetings. So within the very tightly knit voters within the Republican Party, party politics, yeah, this is what they're talking about. Interesting. So do you think that may play a part in a lower Republican turnout today? No, I think what this will be within the uh, within the party itself is you will see a lot more Republicans voting on Election Day than you see doing early voting, which is a reversal of what we've seen classically with early voting when it was generally more Republicans until the Trump administration. It was more Republicans that voted early than Democrats, and you're going to see more Republicans at the polls. Which I think, you know, having been a former political consultant and looking from the outside in, you know, I knew that Republicans tended to vote very strongly via mail. It was a yeah. very convenient way to vote, especially when you consider senior voters c turn out in huge numbers, and it's really convenient for them to not have to go to their polling place. They can just mail it in, literally. And um, Donald Trump, before the 2020 election, started to knock down the idea of mail-in voting. And, and for couples to be able to look at the ballots together and discuss what they think about issues while they're looking at the ballot ballot initiatives and that discussion time where you're not in the booth having to already have decided you're right and that was the convenience and, and the advantage to early voting and it was largely republicans that did it for a long time do you think that hurt donald trump in 2020 um no i don't i don't think i personally don't think that that hurt him in 2020 i think um that in 2020 was an anomaly with republican voters because there were a lot of people that were more turned off by the infighting than it was by anything that was going on with the ballots. Interesting. Uh, how personally. About, how about 2022 here in Arizona? Because Carrie Lake was talking about, you know, you can't trust this, can't trust that. Yeah, but I think that more than anything else, that was helping her base turn out. It was she, the message then was it's more important for you to turn out than ever before gotcha. because of the cheating. Overcome the cheating, yeah. right, the supposed cheating, right. Uh, all right, as we talk with Mike Broomhead here on our presidential preference election special on KTAR News, the Supreme Court just decided to not put Texas's immigration law on hold while it is being decided at the lower court level. And it's interesting because I, I just got a text from uh, Jim Cross, who was out at a polling place this morning, uh, and he said he talked to about 10 to 12 people. Every one of them listed immigration as a top issue. Only two mentioned the economy. Yeah. So here it is again, immigration front and center. And, of course, it's that way across the country, but it's especially so here in Arizona. How big of a part is immigration playing in the PPE today? Huge. I think, it's again, if you're if you're an issue voter, someone that's motivated to get to the polls today, you're going because you are either very, very, you want to emphatically support a candidate or you want to emphatically be against a candidate, and you're going to file a protest vote. If you're see, hearing the number one issue at the polls is um, – is immigration, then you have to imagine that it's mostly or a big number of Republicans that are going to the polls today. Yeah, that, so. that would seem to be the case. Uh, we won't know for a while how how far uh, or how many Republicans actually show up because that's an important part of uh, of the process, right? Well, isn't it? Well, can I just read something very quickly? Sure. The justices Sotomayor and Katanji Brown were the dissenters in this, that wrote the dissent in this decision, and they said it invites further chaos and crisis in immigration enforcement, which I don't necessarily subscribe to, but I will tell you this, Arizona – the president is going to be here tomorrow speaking. He's doing a visit, I think, of intel. But this may or may not come up. But this makes it even bigger for Joe Biden in Arizona because as we speak, the cartels understanding what Texas is doing will be rerouting those caravans of people into Arizona. 
there's that's just how they do business. Right. It's and, like, like whack-a-mole. So we said. are, yeah, because yeah, when we shifted assets as Texas would move assets to Arizona back and forth when there was a surge at the border, they would shift accordingly. Well, now they know Texas local law enforcement is enforcing things. They're going to be rerouting people to Arizona, whether we like it or not. And we already in the tech, I'm sorry, in the Tucson sector of the Border Patrol, uh, how they section out the border, the Tucson sector has seen the highest numbers for months and months and months already. And how much more dangerous does it make it this summer with people crossing into the desert Ugh. with the extreme heat we have? And you and I know the hundreds of deaths every year only is is going to increase, I believe. It's going to increase the chaos in Arizona. And it and it actually gives, I hate to put it this way, but you... you in politics, you have to take advantage of tragedy, right? Yeah. yeah that's how it works. It actually kind of opens the door for Democrats to say, we're all in on this because it's dangerous for the migrants as well. Yeah, and so then does this motivate our Democrat governor for some kind of legislation that she works with the legislature so Arizona can do more, whether it's more federal funding, but how we handle this surge that we're going to see? I'm interested to see what Arizona does next. How, how many Republicans have you heard turned off by the idea that this bipartisan bill that contained a lot of what Republicans had asked for in order to pass the Ukrainian and in Israeli funding, or mainly the Ukrainian funding is the, what they had the issue with. Is that going to backfire on Republicans at all? Are any Republicans going to go, you know what, I thought the Republicans were the party of immigration and now I see they're not. Uh, you know I have a jaded view. The, yeah. an, the answer for me is, short answer is no, because I think the Republicans are going to say, we've been talking about this crisis for years. They've been calling it a crisis for months. One bill is not going to solve the problem. We still want something done. That didn't go far enough. And I think that's going to be where the argument goes. All right. Uh, that is Mike Broomhead. You can catch him again tomorrow at 8 a.m. here on KTAR News when we'll be talking about the presidential preference election in Arizona that was. We're talking about the PPE that is right now and joining us next Stephen richer maricopa county recorder it doesn't matter if somebody's leading by 30 40 percent every single vote we will count we'll talk about counting the votes and the security surrounding that all of it coming up with Stephen richer maricopa county recorder here on our presidential preference election special on ktar news and the man responsible for counting the votes for today's presidential preference election in arizona's most populous county in fact the fourth most populous county in the U.S. is Stephen Richer, Maricopa County recorder, who joins us now on our PPE special on KTAR News. Always good to talk to you. Uh, let's start off with this, the basics. What do you need to bring with you if you uh, still have not voted in the PPE and you intend to? Uh, how long do people have to vote and what other relevant information do they need? Yeah, so let's start with the, 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 the basic deadline, which is 7 p.m. tonight. So you have to either take your early ballot that you received in the mail and drop it off at one of our voting locations or at a drop box by 7 p.m. tonight, or you need to get in line at a voting location, any voting location in Maricopa County, and you need to bring some form of identification for most people that's their Arizona driver's license. And as long as you're in line by 7 p.m. tonight, then you're good to go. You'll get a ballot printed. It will only have one contest on it. If you're a Republican, this will be between, say, Donald Trump, Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis. If you're a Democrat, it will have the Democratic nominees for president of the United States, and then you're ready to rock. All right. And so how many technological changes has the Maricopa County Elections Office made since the 2022 primary and in general elections? The board invested a good amount of money to be able to do two things. One, ensure that all ballots are printed accurately at the voting location. So they invested a few million dollars in new printers. And then two, to be able to tabulate things faster because we all want results faster. And I totally understand that. So we invested in some new tabulation equipment and then also some more space so, so we can just throw more bodies at it so we can have a higher percentage of results available within the first 48 hours. Um, one thing that never speeds up voting is, or at least tabulation, is hand counts, which a lot of people have called for over the last few years. How much would that slow us down if the PPE was hand counted? So 
we actually do do hand counts on a very limited basis. And so after every election, when the results have been tabulated, the political parties will sit in bipartisan teams and they will hand count a statistically significant, randomly selected percentage of the ballots to make sure that the tabulators work. But if you were to tabulate all of the results by hand count, think of a general election where in Maricopa County we'll have about 80 contests on the ballot. There will be about 2 million voters. That's 160 million votes that you would have to be counting by hand in bipartisan teams. And if you remember when we used to wrap coins and you would have to count up 100 pennies, that was hard enough for me to get done as a human. And so I wouldn't want to be counting up to 160 million, get off a little bit and have to start over again. Yeah, whenever my sister would uh, wrap coins, I'd always throw in like 12, 6, 9, you know, just to mess her up. Uh, without getting into specifics, uh, what, what, how well, would We you... won't be recruiting you. We will not be recruiting <laughs> okay, you. Here, That's a good move. We're talking with uh, Stephen Richer, Maricopa County recorder, uh, who is responsible for counting the votes for today's presidential preference election. Without getting into specifics, some of the people that have called for, you know, hand counts only and these other things are, are kind of angry people. Uh, without getting into specifics, specifics how have you stepped up security for the ppe we've got a lot of security hats off to the pds and to the maricopa county sheriff's office arizona department of homeland security I, I, we haven't had any reports of people feeling unsafe voting at voting locations or people working here at our central facility. We would love to keep it that way through 2024. Let's all be good good members of society. You can exercise your First Amendment rights, but there's no need to get violent or get in somebody's face or make a death threat. Uh, those will be prosecuted. Quite a few have been prosecuted in connection to Maricopa County. Don't do it. If you're a leader who has lots of followers, don't encourage people to do it. Let's, uh, let's all keep our heads for this 2024 cycle because we know it will be hot and heavy here in Arizona, and we know that a lot of eyes will be on Arizona. But at the county level, we're, again, investing the resources that are needed to make sure our voters are safe, our workers are safe, and our ballots are safe. What are you hearing from the field uh, as far as the polling locations go? Is this a, a normal turnout, uh, an oversized turnout, a weak turnout? Have you heard much we yet? We had, we had a strong start with early ballots, so we've already received back about 535,000 early ballots prior to today. I, things have been pretty light today. We've had about 15,000 people who have showed up and gotten a new ballot printed and voted at a voting location so far today. And then we'll get a total count on the people who showed up and dropped off their early ballot at a voting location today. I suspect that we'll get another 100,000 by the end of the day, so that puts us into the mid sixes out of about 15, uh, 100, excuse me, out of about 1.5 million, so 650,000 out of about 1.5 million. So probably somewhere around like 40% turnout of the eligible voters for this one. That's not bad for uh, for a primary, is it? No, it's not bad, especially for a race that has, you know, so many candidates who have suspended their campaign. Right. But I, there's a lot of interest in politics in Arizona just because we know how much power we have in the national conversation right now and because it's an easy ballot. Look, you, you only have one contest on it, so there's no excuse really for just letting it lie around your kitchen table. You can you can get that thing done pretty quickly. All right. Stephen Richer, Maricopa County can, uh, Recorder. We'll have more on our presidential preference election special coming up on KTAR News. Thank you to uh, Mike Broomhead. Stephen Richer, Maricopa County recorder, for joining us earlier. And still to come here on our PPE special, Garrett Archer, data analyst at ABC 15. The electorate in Maricopa County and elsewhere, of course, has basically become nationalized. This guy has quite the background. He was a data analyst for the Secretary of State's office a few years ago. Also on the way, Democratic political consultant Stacey Pearson, who says of Joe Biden... He cannot become a bigger target for Carrie Lake and the Tinfoil Hat Brigade. Also on the way, Chris Merrill and Joe Heisinga of the Chris and Joe Show. They'll be joining us all in this hour. Right now, as part of our team coverage of 
Our state's version of a presidential primary, we have reporters out monitoring the presidential preference election at polling places and where they count the votes. So let's start where it all starts, where voters cast their vote if they haven't done so already via mail or a drop-off location. Ballon Overstolz is at the polling location at the Burton Bar Library located just north of downtown Phoenix. Uh, Ballon, is it busy? Is it dead? Moderate turnout? Did you see it pick up at lunchtime? What's it look like to you? Hey, how's it going? Yeah, I would say it's about steady right now. I've been out on these polling centers on different election days where you wouldn't know it's an election day. Mm. But today, you know, you would know uh, there's a steady people, uh, a steady stream of people coming in if they're green envelopes. So, yeah, it's it, there's some activity out here for sure. So a lot of people are actually bringing in they voted at home with their mail in ballot and they're just dropping it off. Just looking around, yeah, it looks like a lot of people have brought their uh, th- their ballots in from home. So what are you hearing from people? Has anybody, you know, marched by chanting a candidate's name or more likely uh, told you what their top issue is? I know today so far out here, we've heard a lot of support for former President Donald Trump. I checked in with KTR senior news reporter Jim Cross when I got down here. That was a lot of what he heard this morning. And I've also heard a different perspective. I spoke with one name, uh, one man named Simran Singh, who's out here telling people to vote for neither Donald Trump or President Joe Biden as essentially a uncommitted vote. Uncommitted is essentially a blank vote, but you can't do that in Arizona. So he's asking people to use their vote as a protest and don't vote for either of them. Vote for one of the other. I think there's six other candidates on the Democratic ballot and uh, eight other candidates on the Republican ballot besides Donald Trump and Joe Biden, right? Yeah, and he's not even endorsing anybody specifically. It's a non-endorsement of the the two main candidates, really. Uh, So for those who haven't already mailed in their ballot for the PPE uh, and they have decided, I want to go in person and, and vote, Um, We talked to Stephen Richer a little while ago, the county recorder, and he kind of broke this down for us. But I always think it's worth reiterating. What do you need to walk in and vote? To walk in and vote, yeah, you definitely need some identification. I I do want to cover first, if you do have that green envelope, you can just come in and vote as is. There's no other step, and you can even skip the line if there is one. But if you are coming in, uh, you do need your state ID. Uh, There's also other types of identification you could use, a valid state identification card, a tribal enrollment card, if if that applies to you, a driver's license. uh, Any of these can be used to vote. All right, and if you uh, want to drive drop off your early ballot, you didn't mail it in in time, or you'd like to do that in person, uh, you can do that there too, right? Yeah, you can come right in and drop that off. Like I said, you can skip the line and you just, yeah, it's very simple and straightforward. And and here's what's also kind of convenient. You can do this at any location. You don't have to do it at your polling place, right? Yeah, exactly. And you can go online, maricopa.gov, and look if you don't know where that closest center is. But, yeah, any of the centers can be used. Yeah, you can't cross the Pinal County line and go vote down there. But, yeah. That's uh, true. Here in the valley, I Yeah, yeah, say. exactly. All right. So w- what if you get out of work late? You don't get to a polling location until 6.55, and there's a line. You're like, what the heck? That You're okay, right? Yeah, if if there's a line, that's great, because you can jump in that line as long as it's not 7, and you will get to vote. I do want to say, since it's not the busiest voting day, there might not be a line waiting for you to let you vote a little bit past 7, you know, a line to jump into. So if you do plan to vote today, you should definitely try to get there past or before 7. Okay, that is Ballon Overstoles at the polling location at the Burton Bar Library, just north of downtown Phoenix. Now let's take you over to Colton Krolak, KTAR news reporter, who's at the Maricopa County Elections Tabulation center where they are counting the votes cast today and those that were already mailed in uh colton what's the process like there at the mctec the maricopa county tabulations election center yeah so they've been uh doing the tabulation the uh, signature verification process all throughout last week and over the weekend they got about five hundred thousand early ballots a little bit more than that that they've been signature verifying and putting through the tabulators. So tonight when it's 8 p.m. and they release those final uh, those final results, uh, the bulk of, of those votes will be uh, in that first wave. Oh, okay. So that, that should make things move along quite quickly once uh, the polling loca- locations close at 7. Uh, we're supposed to start getting results around 8 o'clock, right? Yep, 8, 8 p.m., like I said, about 500,000 early ballots will be in that first wave. So you'll have a really good indication of, of where things are headed within that first wave. Um, but if for whatever reason you didn't early vote, but you got um, 
you were on the list and you just forgot, you can go into a voting center. You can still vote. They'll just cancel out your old ballot and then they'll give you a new one. Okay. So once again, just want to reiterate for those who might have just tuned in or maybe didn't catch this, the ballots they are counting right now are the early ballots that were mailed in before today and maybe some of those that are dropped off at the polling locations or does that wait until after seven? I believe that that waits until after this, uh, after seven, okay. um, the 500,000 that I'm referring to, those were actually all counted and tabulated, uh, heading up into this week. The ones that they're using that they're counting today are the ones over the weekend. Those are the ones that they're signature verif verifying today gotcha. and counting today. Okay, but those are the mail-ins as well, and, and they'll start counting the ones that are dropped off and the ones that were where people actually voted in person using a, a traditional ballot. That They'll do those after polling yeah, locations closed. Correct. Okay, very good. All right. Thanks a lot, Colton Krolak there at the Maricopa County Elections Tabulation Center, uh, where they are counting the votes cast today and where we are keeping an eye on things. I know a lot of people uh, feel like they need to keep an eye on things and uh, maybe, I don't know, um, stick their nose where it doesn't belong. How's that? Uh, that has happened, of course, uh, in a few places. Hopefully that does not end up being the case here. Uh, we did talk a little earlier with Stephen Richer, the Maricopa County Recorder, uh, about some of the security measures that have been taken. And we didn't get into specifics because that's not what you do with security, right? But we did talk uh, about the fact that um, all that kind of stuff will be prosecuted if that ends up being the case. All right, we've got a lot to go still here on our presidential preference election special. Uh, just keep in mind how how historical this all is. Yes, we already know that it's going to be Biden and Trump on the ballot in November, but you have to go back to 1892 to find an election where a former president ran against a current president, and that was when immediate past president Grover Cleveland beat sitting president Benjamin Harrison, who had beaten Cleveland in the 1888 presidential election. Uh, and it is a time when a lot of people are thinking about maybe a protest vote, uh, something that Chuck Coughlin told me about right before the Super Tuesday primaries and, and had to say this about the Republican Party. The party has to learn. Politics is about addition, not subtraction. And these party primaries have turned into the politics of subtraction. Yeah. So we'll see if there ends up being a protest vote either on the Republican side or on the Democratic side against Donald Trump or, uh, in the case of the Democratic Party, of course, Joe Biden. We will get into all of this. In fact, uh, Garrett Archer, data analyst at ABC 15, who used to be a data analyst at the Secretary of State's office, is going to join us to talk about uh, how the electorate is made up of, uh, or how, what it's made up of. It's, of course, you, but it's not just Republicans and Democrats. The electorate in Maricopa County and elsewhere, of course, has basically become nationalized. And Garrett is next on our presidential preference election special. I'm Jim Sharp. You're listening to KTAR News. We are joined by Garrett Archer, data analyst for our TV partners at ABC 15. You used to analyze data for the Secretary of State's office. Uh, so you've been watching elections closely for a long time. I know you were politically involved. We're not going to get into, you know, what brand of politics you were into back in the day. I just appreciate your looking at the numbers and giving us a realistic look. That's why you're here today. Well, thank you so much. Well, let's turn on your okay. microphone there. Uh, there we go. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you very much, Jim. Oh, my, I appreciate that. My bad. My bad. So um, last time I had you in for an election special, we talked about the impact of independent voters. Yes. Because we were one year out from the general election. Um they make up a plurality of voters in Arizona. There are more independent voters than there are Republicans, and there are more independent voters than there are Democrats. Uh, they are the people, by the way, who cannot vote today. Uh, so I'd like to talk about voter registration when it comes to the two major parties. Despite all the talk in recent years about Arizona turning blue, Democrats are still significantly lagging behind. Yeah, they are uh, uh, trending down. Um, you know, Republicans are also trending a little down, but but not as much as the Democrats. Democrats are at about 29.8, I think it is, a little under 30% of the electorate. Uh, Republicans and, and independents, other independents is a... Is a umbrella term for anybody who doesn't choose Republican, Democrat, or a major party, by the way. Right. Uh, the other uh, is now about 34.6, and Republicans are like 34.4. So they're very close to each other, but right now, today, uh, independents, uh, other, are the 
plurality. Uh, that could change next month. In fact, as we get closer to the election, it's more likely that uh, we'll see more registration in Republicans and Democrats, uh, and independents may will probably drop to number two here in the next uh, couple months. Interesting. What do you? And, and I, I'm, I'm asking you to just analyze this from a, a standpoint that doesn't involve politics. What do you think drives that? Um, I think, uh, well, we've seen this before. Uh, the, 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 there's sort of a cycle to voter registration. Um, after 2016, uh, independence started to fall as far as the the, the amount of people, uh, the, the, what choice was being made. So people were choosing to either register as Democrats or Republicans at the time. Uh, and then after 2020, it changed back to basically half of new registrations are independent other. And this is actually a more common thing. We've seen that more often since like, really the year 2000 on to about 2020 so don't, don't, excuse me 2016 so 15 years of rising independent numbers and then that sort of stopped in 2016 and it's kind of started up again so interesting uh, does it so we kind of see this maybe the cycle change again as you're in a presidential election year yeah uh it, we, we're seeing again that the cycle sort of yeah. revert to the norm right now uh -huh. um, and it you know depending on what happens in november it could change again. I mean, it, you know, the the as as I think I've said before, the uh, Arizona electorate, just like many other electorates, are pretty much uh, respond and react to what happens nationally. And so, whatever happens at that presidential level, uh, we sh we should see start sort of evolve in our voter registration numbers as well. Uh if you could please draw on your time working in the Secretary of State's office as we talk with Garrett Archer, data analyst at ABC 15, what historically has been our turnouts for primaries and presidential preference elections? So as a, I, I got to tell you, as an as an election analyst, the presidential preference is probably the least, it's sort of our dress rehearsal. It's it's the least important for us as analysts because it's it has very, uh, there, it, it doesn't have a peer election because it really is only one contest. Right. Uh, and sometimes Republicans don't have that contest, sometimes Democrats don't have that contest. So uh, it, there's really no way to compare a PPE to other PPEs. So just to sort of put that out. Okay. Uh, as far as the uh, turnout goes, uh, turnout can get as high as sort of a standard primary, which is around 50%, but uh, it looks like it's probably going to be lower than that this year. Yeah, this was Stephen Richard was saying, uh, suggesting it was going to be in the 40 to 45% yeah. range. Yeah, it, it looks like that. Oh, interesting. Uh, do you... Do you buy take any stock into what I've heard from some of the political um, consultants saying it's going to be important to see what percentage of Democrats vote for Joe Biden or what percentage of Democrats uh, of Republicans vote for Donald Trump to help to determine if they're going to get over the hump? You know, and have sure. and be able to drag enough independents along, but they have to get their base to vote for them. So. Um so as as again as an analyst, um, uh, as much as uh, everyone's always going to make an opinion, have to pundit on an election, even if right. I just told you that it's not as important as some of the others. So <laughs> right. that being said, uh, as someone who does look at these things, I, I'm kind of looking at that 8515. That's sort of my number for both of them. So if Trump gets 85 percent of the vote. Uh, to 15% quote resistance or, or you know, anti-Trump vote, I sort of tacked it up to sort of standard numbers. Same thing with Joe Biden. If we start seeing that number dip uh, down into the 80s or the 75, that shows that maybe there's the, the, the anti-Trump, anti-Biden vote did have still a lot more uh, uh, desire to vote, even though the nominees are pretty much set at this point. I mean, they are set. They're not. It's not pretty much set. They are set. Um, and so, seeing if if that resistance vote goes by goes past that fifteen percent is going to be interesting to me. I don't. I don't know if it means anything in the future, but I do want to see what happens with both candidates getting to that that number. With, with, with lower raw numbers for Democrats, though, isn't it more important that Joe Biden actually get a higher percentage of his? Um, base to vote for him, or yeah, are, are independents leaning more to the left this year? I, I would say that that again, just looking at some of the other primaries uh, uh, that we've seen, especially the ones that are, are closed. Uh, Joe Biden should be in the nineties. Um, you know, he, he should be very high. He did. He never really had true to, true opponents. Yeah. Um, you know, Trump at least had some opponents that at least you know had supporters had had coalitions. Uh, Biden never really had anything like that. So so. Technically, Biden's numbers should be higher. As far as uh, a protest vote for Biden, I mean that that's going to be his coalition that not, you know is, is going to respond to things like what's going on in the in the in the Gaza Strip. Um, you know, you'll have a certain member uh, portion of Democrats, especially young, very left leaning ones, that are going to you know fire off a protest vote against Biden on that specific issue. That at least you know, as someone who's looking at this stuff, that's what I would think.
Are we, once we get to November, are we going to see things basically lay out the way they always lay out in a November presidential election year? And that is, you know, I keep hearing how young people are breaking for Trump, um, but they don't tend to vote. Is it, is anything going to, in your opinion, is anything going to change this time around? Or are we going to see a very strong senior vote and younger people are kind of like, yeah, this doesn't really affect me that much. Look, the, the electorate, uh, the way I look at it is I, I think of it as a battleship or like literally a carrier group. It's really hard to turn something like that. It doesn't turn on a dime. So right. in, when I say that, it means I think that even though, you know, we're looking at the same two candidates, I, I, personally don't think we're going to see large numbers of young people turning out comparatively to what we've seen in the past. We may see, you know, three or four or five, six points uh, increase, and that's huge for any candidate, by the way, but we're not going to see, like, uh, uh, people under 35 even getting one anywhere near what people over 65, uh, the amount of voters. It's, it's just not going to happen. Uh, that's just pretty standard stuff. Again, we're, we're, we're talking about the margins here. Sometimes if, if it's not the margins, it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. So, uh, you know, we will see what happens. All right. Uh, that is uh, ABC 15. Our TV partners, ABC 15's data analyst, Garrett Archer. Uh, I, I love following him on X. Uh, it's Garrett underscore Archer, Archer, right? Two R's, two T's. Two R's, two T's. And, of course, you can always consume the Data Guru Junior pictures, uh, DGJ, <laughs> who, who always makes a, a – you know, is he going to pop up for an election night special we'll picture see. tonight? We'll okay. see. All right. Uh, on the way still here on our presidential preference election special, Democratic political consultant Stacey Pearson, who says of Joe Biden – He certainly could do – Congressman Gallego a favor by performing well, considering they're aligned on, on many, many policies. She's next. Chris Merrill and Joe Heisinga of the Chris and Joe Show also joining us before the hour's up. You're listening to KTAR News. A little earlier, we uh, played you some sound of Chuck Coughlin of High Ground Incorporated uh, breaking down what to look for today. And that is what is going to be the voter turnout for the specific parties. But also, we talked about uh, protest votes. Uh, Jamie West and I did on Arizona's Morning News. There are other names on the ballot. Are we going to see much of a protest vote from either Republicans or Democrats? And is it important for those who would like to send the parties a message? Yeah, I think it is, Jamie. I think I think we will see some of that today. There's now, how much is a question that we are going to pose to Democratic political consultant Stacey Pearson, co-founder of Lumen Strategies, who joins us now on our presidential preference election special. Stacey, always good to talk to you. Um, hi. Good hi. to talk to you. We've, we've talked a lot about the protest vote. More than one political expert I've talked to says that a Trump protest vote has a bigger effect as a Republican. But I know that many Democrats aren't thrilled with an octogenarian leading their party. Will we see many votes for uh, Dean Phillips or a Marianne Williamson or any of the other non-Biden Democratic candidates today? I think they got a very late start trying to organize that. It's not like we've seen in other states. I got two uh, texts this morning from Marianne Williamson herself, I'm sure, asking me to vote for her in protest, (laughs) but my ballot's been in for two weeks. So I literally walked it from my office to the county recorder's office. So it doesn't look like a particularly sophisticated operation, not like we've seen in Michigan, for example. Right. But is it more a matter of people walking in and they're saying, you know what, Um, anybody but Joe Biden, uh, I'm just he's not the guy that's supposed to be leading the party of young people, a guy in his 80s. um, So I'm I don't care if it's a Marianne Williamson or a Dean Phillips or any of the other people that are available on the on the Democratic ballot, I'm just going to protest vote, period. I think we see that in every election where people write folks in. Certainly the president's age uh, has a particular impact, but unfortunately young people don't vote in primaries. They vote, they are so horrifically underrepresented mm-hmm. that I don't think we can really apply what happens today to the broader electorate. And I guess it's kind of their fault <laughs> that they're not represented because yeah, they just indeed. don't show up and vote. Indeed. And yeah, and we've got, I was just looking at the numbers this 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 March compared to four years ago, and we have 186,000 additional voters in Maricopa County. The Democrats have lost registered voters. The Republicans have gained in just about equal numbers. And then the independents, that, that 
voting block has grown tremendously, grown by about 145,000. Those folks didn't get a ballot. And if they moved here from California and live in Vistancia now, or if they came in as retirees and have a nice little place in Sun Lakes, they don't know why they didn't get a vote. They don't know why they, it, this is not a traditional system for other states. Mm, yeah, very good point. Uh, we're talking to Democratic political consultant Stacey Pearson of Lumen Strategies. What percentage of primary votes will Biden have to secure today to make you comfortable that he has the necessary Democratic support, you know, of his base to go along with the moderate and the left-leaning independents that it takes and in order to pull votes. off a win in November? <laughs> What's that? Uh, I, uh, I would say 10 votes total. <laughs> for, for Arizona, this is such a foregone conclusion. We've had a couple of Super Tuesdays. Days. We know who's going to be on the top of the ticket in November. So Arizona is at such a distinct disadvantage because our independents can't vote and because the end of the story has already been written. Like this is watching the, you know, this is this is watching the end of the movie before you get to well, but, but, um, you know, get to see the opening credits. But I was talking about, you know, how what percentage does he need to get today to make you comfortable that he wins in November? Because you have to have a certain percentage of your base voting for you to go along with the independents uh, uh, that are going to vote for Joe Biden this fall in order to pull off that win like he had in 2020. Yeah, 75, 80, 85 percent. Our turnout is going to be so depressed yeah. because of the system being broken here um, that, uh, you know, if, if he's if, if so long as I'm not even kidding, if he gets 10 votes today, I think that'd be great. <laughs> and if Marianne Williamson gets two, that those texts must have worked for somebody. Uh, we're once again talking to Stacey Pearson. Uh, I, uh, by the way, have you been employed by anybody who wants to change the PPE? It sounds like it almost to me. Uh, no, I've not, <laughs> okay. actually. I, in fact, I philosophically disagree with Chuck Coughlin on this issue. Uh, it, it is. <laughs> I think open primaries in Arizona can also be a recipe for disaster, but... Um, yeah, at least at least in this system and the date, I think the date of our primary preference election is so late in the cycle that the East Coast has already decided for us. And that's unfortunate. Does this have any effect on the Senate race? Because, uh, you know, it, much in the same way that it's going to be Biden and Trump in the fall, we know it's going to be Kerry Lake and Ruben Gallego in the fall. D does... Does Biden maybe not doing well today or Trump not doing well today affect their down ballot candidates of Kerry Lake and Ruben Gallego? So I wish I could say yes, and we could just apply this formula that if they get under 83 percent, this means down ballot looks difficult. Right. But in Arizona, we're going to bubble up from the bottom in terms of Democratic enthusiasm, and that's going to be a huge benefit to Ruben Gallego. And that's an abortion. So abortion, if the abortion measure that restores access and distor it restores um, a woman's right to choose bubbles up from the bottom, of, and it will, bubbles up from the bottom of the ballot, then that is going to have a, a very positive impact at the top. We're talking about the presidential preference election on this PPE special here on KTAR News. But uh, speaking of presidents, uh, one is going to be here uh, this afternoon, and he's going to be speaking publicly. He'll be at a fundraiser tonight, but he'll be speaking publicly tomorrow, mainly about the CHIPS Act. He's going to be at Intel, from what we understand. Uh, but does he also have to mention the border, Stacey? Oh, I would hope he does. It, it, and I'm sure he's going to blame the Republicans for the deal that was that, the deal that fell apart. But he has to talk about the border in Arizona. We have been dealing with this federal ineptitude for decades now, and you cannot talk about public safety in Arizona without talking about rampant immigration, without solutions that ha and, and the humanitarian crisis that's associated. You and, just can't. And then with the Supreme Court saying today they're not going to put a temporary order in place stopping Texas from actually right. exercising their immigration law. So that's going to be that's generally if it so if it works its way up to the Supreme Court, because this is a ruling about the lower courts. If it works its way up to the Supreme Court, it's kind of an indication that the Supreme Court's going to rule with Texas uh, and, and allow that that state law dealing with immigration to stay in place. It becomes a larger and larger issue in the November election, doesn't it? You're exactly right. And this Supreme Court is not the one, clearly not the one that limited Arizona's 1070. And so the, the composition of this court is so extraordinarily different that this, the ruling today that allows Texas to 
overwrite federal immigration policy and law is is really something that we need to be keeping a very close eye on here in the state. Okay, because thanks. Who's, who's, who's going to pay for that? Arizona, right? Right, right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks so much, uh, Stacey Pearson there, Democratic political consultant, co-founder of Lumen Strategies. On the way, Chris and Joe of the Chris and Joe Show as we wrap up our presidential preference election special here on KTAR News. I'm Jim Sharp. All right. Uh, we are joined now on our presidential preference election special with Chris Merrill and Joe Heisinga of the Chris and Joe Show. Just uh, real quickly, I, I just love throwing this out there because I think it's so awesome. Uh, we had Brooks Simpson, ASU presidential historian on with us on Arizona's Morning News. This is right after the Super Tuesday primaries, and he laid out how historical this this race is uh, for Jamie West. So have we ever in U.S. history had a former president running against a current president? Uh, yes, we have, but you have to go back to 1892. 1892, when immediate past president Grover Cleveland beat sitting president Benjamin Harrison, who had beaten Cleveland in the 1888 presidential election it, it, it is historic chris is it not it sure is i mean if and if history is any indicator it could happen again right <laughs> good absolutely good. Right. if you go by what the polling is right now um it would it would be trump that would uh, win in a general election but hey we've got a lot of ground to cover between now and then jim you brought then something up interesting yeah. you said that if we were to take into account the polling today and i think back to the polling that we've seen in past presidential elections involving uh, former president Trump, because there was this tendency of people he underpolled in 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 recent history, and there was this thought by the political scientists at the time that f he was underpolling because people didn't want to admit publicly <laughs> that they <laughs> were going to for vote for him, right. especially in 2016, <laughs> right. uh, because uh, Hillary was this overwhelming favorite. He was the reality show guy, and so they they said. Uh, well, I'm not going to tell anybody, but since you're asking me as a pollster, and it's just between you and me, I'll tell you I'm going to vote for, for Trump. But they, he would under-poll in some cases. Now I feel, and we'll see how this plays out. There's no, we won't know until it's done. But I feel like maybe that's sort of flipped, where you have some people that, that say, oh, yeah, I'm voting for Trump. Uh, and I'm curious as to whether or not they actually will, or if those are people who are maybe independents that are still thinking about changing their votes, or if those votes could change based on what happens with him in some of these different court proceedings over the course of the next few months, too. So the polling right now is interesting, but I wonder how much that's going to have you know context in the future. Joe, do you agree with this theory of your partner? Uh, no, I don't, <laughs> like usual. I, I think, I'm just here to stir the pot. I think he's part right, but I actually think... People aren't too proud to admit that they're going to the polls voting for either one of these guys. So I, I don't know if that means that you would see third party numbers art artificially inflated or what, but I don't know anybody. Wait, wait, wait a second. They're not too proud to not admit they're voting no, they're for. They're not. They're. See, this is what I deal with every day, enough. Jim. They're it's not proud enough to admit that they're voting. They don't want to admit that they are voting gotcha. for either Trump or Biden. They gotcha. did not want to not say whether they were whether or not <laughs> they were voting one way or not the other. Keep you know? going. Wow. <laughs> there you go. Nailed it. <laughs> so the only reason I ask all this is because I, you know, we're trying to bring some context to this because this is not, people are not wasting their time voting in our PPE, but if you listen to some people, they're going to, it's like, well, it's already going to be Trump. It's already going to be Biden. Doesn't, why does it matter? I shouldn't even bother voting or whatever. Uh, but it, it counts. Does it? I'm kind of with those people. Does it? It, it? it already has been decided. I mean, to me, regardless of what Arizona does today. Right. This is a very expensive polling project for the parties right now. In <laughs> to my me, opinion. it's like a practice it, right? run. It to is. To make sure that everything will go well in July and in November. They're trying to gauge voter enthusiasm, like how many of my voters will get out there. And, uh, and they're really putting it on us the taxpayers to fund this thing too because if you're if you're an independent like joe and i are you don't get to participate you right? can if you change your party and then want to change it back to independent if you yeah if you jump through the hoops right what, nothing what? says freedom like do it my way one person in my house gets to vote in the ppe and it's not me i'll just put it that way so wow. I, yeah i know it's not fair and she's just been walking around hmm, here's my ballot <laughs> huh. uh it's not nice at all uh but Wow. It is important in the sense of, yeah, 
gauging how much support you have within your party. Right. Because you have to have a certain level of engagement within your own party to then add on to that the independents that are going to vote for you because they are the largest voting bloc currently in Arizona. Um, so it matters in that sense, does it not, Joe? It does, and that's why you have President Biden coming out here this week, too. I think he's nervous that he does not have the support that he had four years ago and that there are a lot of people out there who sit there and go, uh, you know, maybe that Trump guy wasn't so bad. Maybe we want to go down that road again. Or, you know, you've got the Trump voters who are like, man, can't stand the dude, but love the way the country was when he was president. Them gas prices, grocery store, everything else was a lot cheaper. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot to be said for uh, people voting with their pocketbooks, right? All right. Uh, that's going to do it for our presidential preference election special here on KTAR News.